next stop will be Birmingham New Street. Well, as you can uh, probably hear, I'm on the road with my radio again, this time on a train between Liverpool and Birmingham. I spend my life on public transport, which would no doubt be approved of by Roger Hallam, co-founder of Extinction Rebellion and one of the driving forces behind Just Stop Oil. He was the guest on Nick Robinson's Political Thinking podcast this week, and I found this interview rather chilling, but not, I think, for the reasons that Roger Hallam wanted me to. I have no words of comfort, right? Let me say that again. I have no words of comfort for your audience. What I'm saying to you and your audience is get real, right? This is not the time to look for comfort. It's the time to actually understand how totally terrible this situation is and to act accordingly. But that's your duty, right, as a parent, as a citizen and as a human being. Some people will be inspired by what you say. Other people will be terrified, thinking if he is so clear about this in his mind, he'll stop at nothing. It's not just inconvenience, it's not just civil what disobedience. I'm, what I'm clear what about, would it be? What, what I'm clear about is what's clear, <laughs> OK? Objectively clear, which is there's a thing out there yeah. called physics. Yeah, no, but right? I'm asking whether there's any limits to this. The limits to what you do? Yeah. We have to engage in civil disobedience, civil resistance, to the point that we fundamentally change the regime, right? The regime of, of digging fossil fuels out of the out of the ground i don't know quite what that looks like and i don't need to right you don't need to have all the information to act what you have to have is the visceral horror of what's happening and what we need to do is in november is go down to london and engage in civil disobedience because that's our best bet no one's pretending it's going to be successful no one's pretending that just stop always necessarily the best thing ever right but that's what that's the opportunity your viewers have. And it's the opportunity, dare I say, for you and also all these people, right? Well, the ones behind right. the glass who the, are yes. pressing every, the buttons every, and the my producers. No, don't smile about this. It's very serious, right? This is the opportunity for you at the BBC to fulfil your duty to the British people, well, which is to say to the British government, you will no longer cooperate... With a genocidal regime. Yeah, no, it's not the duty of the BBC to do anything of the sort, is. unfortunately. Well, it, it may be in your mind. Because what we're my talking duty about... To what we're talking tell us what's about, happening in November, because we don't know what's happening no, no, in November. No, 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 I'm not letting you go on that. What we're talking about here is treason against the British people. You're applying right? for a job. Now, what is happening in November? You've told people you want to come to London in November, but I don't know, they don't know, what it is you're talking about. What I want to say to your audience is, is your reaction over the last two minutes is symptomatic of why they're being betrayed. Like, you're belittling of your responsibility and these people to actually make a concrete step to save our country. And you will suffer the consequences of it in the next decade. I'm suffering it in this interview at the no. moment. Now, what is it what is happening in November that you think you will people be should do? You will be taken okay. to court. You will be taken will to be? court. You will be. As oh, a member person, of the British right. establishment. Okay. All right. Right? You need to take this seriously. I'm going to be taken to court for what? You absolutely will be taken to court as for, a member of the what? British establishment for betraying the British people during the 2020s. Yeah. Right? But you what, need to what think would about I be that. guilty of? You will be guilty of treason. Well, see you in court, Nick. I once heard an Extinction Rebellion spokesperson say that they weren't really interested in winning over the hearts and minds of ordinary people. And having heard this interview, I have to say, I think it's probably just as well. Disruption works. Disruption is justified. So says my guest this week, Roger Hallam, the co-founder of Extinction Rebellion and the mastermind of Just Stop Oil. He joins me here on Political Thinking, an opportunity for a conversation with, not a news interrogation of, someone who shapes our political thinking about what has shaped theirs. Hallam argues, and I quote, that only mass civil resistance can stop the global 1% imposing mass death on billions of people. Agree with him or passionately disagree? There's no denying that he's one of the most potent organisers of political protests of recent times. Roger Hallam, welcome to Political Thinking. Right. That quote came from your website. There's another quote on the front page. 
It says the essence of what is human is the ability to make a decision, a conscious decision about what is right in life. What did you mean? Well, I thought we were going to talk about this later in the interview, but OK, we'll start with the big point. So the big point, I, I, I suppose, is that at a time of existential crisis, people have to and tend to make a decision about what's right and wrong. And they base their decision on, on that virtue, on the notion of virtues. They don't make utilitarian decision. They don't go what will work, what won't work. And I think our culture's in the process of transitioning towards a realisation we don't have control. We have control over our own lives, we don't have control over what's going to happen over the next 30 years. And so what's most important is we live a good life, in an Aristelian sense, dare I say it. And that's where I'm at, and that's broadly what I promote to people in terms of them making a decision to go into resistance. Do you mean that... What I spend my day job doing, asking questions of politicians about this or that policy initiative, in a sense, misses the point as far as you're concerned when it comes to the threat that we're now facing. Yeah, well, uh, the danger of disrupting you. <laughs> I'm just going to read you a quote. So hopefully your audience can understand a little bit more viscerally what we're actually talking about. So, you know, I get sent science articles three or four times a day. So there's nothing particularly unique about this, but it came out about a month ago from a peer-reviewed paper uh, in a journal called Energies. And this is what it says. If warming reaches or exceeds two degrees centigrade, mainly richer humans will be responsible for killing roughly one billion mainly poorer humans. OK, so as a result, the climate change produces drought, produces famine and, and, and so on and so forth. No. What that quote is saying is climate change is not killing anyone. It's mainly richer human beings who are killing poorer human beings. And the tool of the DEF project is destruction of the climate. Tool is an interesting word, and I, I quoted you as saying the global 1% are imposing mass death. You're arguing that this is a conscious, a deliberate, a calculated act by those people, are you, rather than the byproduct of what they would no doubt justify as growth, expansion of wealth, and so on. It's an interesting intellectual digression. <laughs> But you to, think this is the point? To split hairs over what degree of murder it is. No, it's a genuine question because it's know, your I'm, language. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> just choosing my words carefully. I think when your audience hears that, you've got two options, and you've got two options, which is to try and intellectualise around it. And, you know, ask a reasonable intellectual question, which is to what degree is it murder, which to, to what degree is it manslaughter? But that is a displacement activity. The main human response to that should be massively emotional. Emotional about what's going to happen to you, what's going to happen to your family, what's going to happen to the country, what's going to happen to the whole world what's going to happen for the next 100,000 years, because this is going to go on and on. And the biggest problem is journalists like yourself, with all due respect, and a lot of elite people are incapable of emotionally connecting. And what we know from you know ancient wisdom, but also from modern psychology, is that reason is a product of emotion. Unless you can actually feel the terror and horror of what I've just said, you're not going to be able to act rationally and reasonably in response to that horror. Now, one of the things I want to understand in this interview is how you think and how you have very successfully persuaded other people to think. Do you think that emotional reaction, the thing you say I'm incapable of, but the interview's not about me, is what you did successfully produce a few years back in that very successful few days for you when Extinction Rebellion brought chaos to the streets of London, if you're a critic, or 
finally showed how many people were willing to stand up and be counted and to fight for, uh, to fight for, against climate change. So I disagree with what you just said. I think it is about you and it's about the audience. So one of the things you learn about how to persuade people or how to create mobilisation is about centering things on the actual moment, this moment, right? We have a moment here. I'm talking to you. You're talking to me. A whole number of people are listening to this. Let's focus on our responsibilities and our emotions. When we've just heard that 1,000 million people will, note the quote, will be killed by mainly rich people in the next two generations, right? If we're going to actually survive this beyond traumatic experience, which is effectively locked in, we have to learn to think about the immediacy of the moment rather than engage in what I would describe as the privilege of detachment, right? You know, you're doing this interview, that's all well and good. If we were in 1995, I would be answering your questions and very grateful, but we're not in 1995, we're in 2023. What I'm interested in, is, let's say I reacted in the way that is want the right word, you, you would want me to... And what you don't want me to do, and this isn't this interview, is to say, well, some scientists don't agree with that number and they don't agree with this timescale. We're not having that debate today. That's uh, that's for another time and another place, because there are other views, as you know. What is it that you want the reaction to be of me or anybody else? It's, my God, this should stop and it should stop now. Is that the reaction well, you expect? But... <laughs> The very question of how do you want me to react for me shows that you simply haven't taken the information on. You know, if someone came through that door and said, your partner's in hospital, you wouldn't be saying, well, what sort of reaction do you want me to have to that? You'd be going, I've got to go, Roger. Bye. There's an emergency. You know, like three years ago, the British Parliament, as you know, four years ago, I think it was now, made a decision right, on behalf of this country, that we are in an emergency. That was the wording that they that used, was the wasn't it? Theresa May was Prime Minister. It came but soon no after, one, soon after Extinction yes, Rebellion took to the streets. No one in the political class, including yourself and your colleagues at the BBC, have even come close to understanding and acting upon what an emergency is. An emergency is when you clear the decks, Right. What we should be talking about in this interview is not a nice gentlemanly discussion about my background and, you know, what I think about the theory of social change. If you have me on for a whole bunch of series, we can go into that. But I haven't been on the BBC for, what, three years now. The last time I was on was Hard Talk and, what was it called, more or less said I was making it up when I said billions of people were going to die, right? I've got half an hour on your show there's an emergency, what I want to talk about is you. Because you have enormous... Well, this is interesting. So you, you want in... to come on to an interview programme and interview me rather than the other yes, way around. Yes, because that's how yeah. social change works. Yeah, well, social I'm going to ask you some questions and you can ask me yeah, some questions. Why don't finish. we do a deal let, halfway? Let, let me just finish. I'm not going to go on for ages. Let me just finish and say the process of social change, the process of, of getting things done in emergency is all about transgression. It's all about saying what you're saying is not important. This is what's important sure. because it's objectively important because that's what an emergency is. No, I'm, right? I'm, I'm teasing you gently, but you're suggesting that by hijacking this interview, in a sense, this is a form of civil resistance like the, that that you have it, it's promoted. Not, it's not a move, right? Well, it's it not is. A no, it's not, right? You can well, construct it as that, but it's not. Well, what is like, it it's then, a if it's not a move? It's a visceral reaction to my total horror that yeah. the British establishment has completely failed to protect the people of this country. Well, forgive me, Roger, you went to uh, university and you studied civil resistance for a long time. You came into this interview with a lot of notes written down. You do make moves, you do make calculations. One of the reasons you're interesting to interview is because strategically you have turned out two of the most successful, influential protest movements this country has seen in recent times. So 
Let's not pretend you, you don't. You don't work things out. No, obviously not. I'm human, and I spend a lot of hours each day trying to work out what to do and what not to do. Yeah. But the, the critical point here that I'm trying to make, and to your audience, because it's your audience I've come to speak to. No disrespect to you, right? Is is when something so awful as this is happening. You have to get your existential ducks in a row. You need to decide what sort of person you are and what sort of life you want to lead. And the fundamental question is how you're going to lead a good life, right? Most people don't think about this much because, you know, most of the time it's fairly obvious. Look after your family, you have a good job. But there's a massive missing element, which is to protect your country and to protect the human race. Perfectly fair point. And why don't we do a deal, which is I ask you some of the questions... I want to ask you, and you ask me some. And it's a podcast. We've got we've got time to do both. What you've just said, I think, raises quite a fundamental question, which is, is it fear, is it anger, is it what you called visceral emotion that will drive change, or is it hope? Now, only in the last few days we've seen the Prince of Wales talking about the importance of hope when it comes to climate change. And he would see himself, I think the king would see himself as somebody who's argued passionately for change. And my guess is privately they'd say, come on, Ron I mean, if you scare the pants off people, that's not going to work at all. What do you say to people who say that? I say that you are not being true to yourself if you engage in utilitarian, like, distractions. At this what stage. hope is utilitarian destruction? What I'm saying is, is, I know you don't believe me, but I'm just going to assert it again. Right? I'm not coming into this interview like with a whole bunch of moves. I'm coming in to say something that's fundamentally truthful. When I helped to initiate Extinction Rebellion and Just Stop Oil, my fundamental rule is to say the truth and to act as if it's real. That was the foundation. And if you want my analysis on why Extinction Rebellion was so successful, it was because the founders were not interested in being successful. They were interested in telling the truth. That's a completely different logic. I understand that as a motive, but it is also the case that having studied successful civil resistance and protest movements, you came up with, I think, maybe it came from someone else, a theory of 3.5%, an idea of how many people needed to resist in society to make a difference. Just talk us through the mindset, if you would. If you, if you study the history of civil disobedience, as I have, the, the starting point, right, the starting point of the power of civil disobedience movements is the decision to act on the truth. Like, not a postmodernist version of the truth, not like, oh, there's Roger's truth and there's someone else's truth, right? We know, ultimately, you can't say what the truth is, but for practical circumstances, mm -hmm. if someone murders your offspring and someone says, oh, well, it's just a matter of your opinion, you're not going to be very impressed. You know, you, your, your daughter or son is dead. It's dead. It's an objective reality. What we're dealing with here is the objective reality of physics, that if we put more carbon into the atmosphere and we allow the elites to do that, then billions of people will die. You know, maybe six billion, maybe three million billion. But well, it's an obscene yeah. discussion and I don't want to go there, right? Yeah, no, and I don't want to have an argument about but numbers. We, I'm what, not a scientist, what, you're not a scientist, we, and we don't know what, it's a forecast. What we need to understand is this is a unique moment in human history. Mm. We can look at we can look at civil resistance like, you know, in various other contexts. But this is totally new. Sure. What I'm interested in is what you are saying, and you are talking to people via this podcast and programme, is necessary to make that change. You're telling them that you want them to join in with civil resistance. You're saying sometimes to people who've never been on a protest in their life, I'd like you to get arrested if you're willing to be arrested. I'd like you to go to prison. What I'm asking you is, how is that going to change the thing that you say is so frightening? Well, the th first thing to say about disruption is, you know, I'm interviewed a lot about this question. And as far as I'm concerned, it's a bad faith question, right? It's a cynical question. And the reason it's a cynical question, you know, why disrupt, Roger, is everyone disrupts. Well, Everyone I'm not asking disrupts. you why you disrupt. I'm asking you yeah. to explain to people who you want well, to disrupt. Well, this is what I say to people. How it'll right? work. 
you know, I, 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 we will is, come to whether is, you're this counterproductive. Is, this, How does is it work? I, this is what I say to people. Yeah. Say, people say, oh, why, why should we engage in disruption? Why should we engage in civil disobedience to the point of rest? And what I say is you're being dishonest with yourself, right? The reason you're being dishonest with yourself is that if you have values and those values are disrupted, everyone disrupts. Historically, right-wing people disrupt, left-wing people disrupt. The determining factor is, are you utterly horrified by a social development such that you cannot live with yourself and not engage in disrupting your society? Ultimately, disruption is war, right? You know, there's very few people that would argue that disrupting Hitler was a bad idea, otherwise known as World War II. Right. So you can work back from that. And what we say, what I'm saying here is if you have someone come into your interview and say a billion people are going to be killed. That's a no brainer. Right? That's 20 World War Twos. Ah, but I'm interested. You said disruption is war. It's a war against who? It's a war against those people who are engaging in mass murder. Who are they? The global elites. But who are they? I mean, it's, it's a phrase. Well, practically speaking, in this country, it means the UK government and the forces behind the UK government. But the UK government has a constitutional responsibility as the people that control the British state. Now, after you and your supporters occupied the streets, particularly of London, in 2019, after, what, a thousand odd people got arrested, the UK government not only listened... They would no doubt deny there was a direct link to the declaration of a climate emergency, but they did declare a climate emergency in Parliament. Also, some of your representatives, not you, but got to meet with Michael Gove, who was then the Environment Secretary. Did it feel to you like a moment where, wow, these people are, they are actually listening? Well, this this is a really mind-bellowingly stupid question, right? One billion people... We can swap, if you like. You can do my job and I'll do yours. <laughs> with all due we respect, do that? right? I love the addition of with all due respect. It's a mind to, to that, that makes I'll it tell you a lot why better. it's a mind-blowingly yeah. stupid question. Yeah. Is, is, and this comes back to emotional like connection, right? Yeah. I, I mean, I've got no expectation of you emotionally connecting, right, with, with what I've just said, because you're part of that system that isn't able to connect. While I'm coming, when I'm coming I, on to this programme... I'm paid not to take the side of people who are in front y- of me to be interviewed. Yes, That's yes what I'm exactly, paid for. exactly. Yeah. You're paid, but also it's part of the culture. The psychopathic culture of the British elite is just not to connect with the emotional reality of what's going to be imposed on the British but, but, people. But just get to why, why. I don't wish to invite you to endlessly repeat how stupid I am, but why is it not a sensible question to say, did you feel then you were getting somewhere and do you not feel now that you're well, getting what I, somewhere? What I'm trying to say is, like, the pretense that the British establishment is taking seriously its responsibilities is self-evidently ridiculous, given the gravity of what we face. But did it feel that way then? Or was there a moment you thought... Not for a second that you'd won, of course not. But we're shifting things, we're moving things, things are changing. Yes, there was a moment when the British establishment, the political class of this country, had the opportunity to fulfil its most grave obligations towards the, the British nation, the British people, and it utterly failed. That was in 2019? That was in was 2019, it? when there was 10,000 people on the streets of London and it was an opportunity, Right. That was a very graceful, very well organised, very peaceful protest, as everyone knows. I spoke to the head police officer afterwards and he said he'd never known such a big congregation of people doing civil disobedience that had led to no police officer having any injury at all. Well, I remember being on Waterloo. So this was an opportunity. This was an an opportunity. It right, wasn't, it wasn't British... much of a party for people who couldn't get across the bridge and had important jobs to do, of course, but it was a party for those who were on the bridge. It was an opportunity missed. Well, now, that meant that you changed your approach. You adopted different tactics, tactics which led you to fall out, even with your own daughter at one point. Yes. So I think the next question you should be asking... Can I ask you the question I want to ask? And then you can ask me the question that I'm meant to ask, OK? You fell out with your daughter. She said, and indeed she threatened to walk out of Extinction Rebellion unless you left it. No. There's a documentary I, that shows I, that I, happening. I, I don't want to answer that question because I don't think it's that important, right? What the, the important question... I mean, you can ask me questions and I choose whether to answer them, right? No, no. But my Let response... me put it another way and then, then you can tell me. Um, OK, you don't want to talk about 
the personal thing, but there was an argument, wasn't there, about whether you could keep the party atmosphere of Extinction Rebellion going, if you like, or whether you actually had to harden up, which you wanted to do, with causing disruption at Heathrow. And it led eventually to just stop oil. It did, but that's not what is important in a half-hour interview. What's important in this half-hour interview... I'll is give you ask... more time if you want. <laughs> <laughs> OK. What's important in this half-hour interview is to focus on the pathology of the British establishment in its treasonous inability to understand politically, emotionally, what is coming down the line, right? This is what's avoided over and over again by the media, right? It's this focus on the civil disobedience, the focus on this movement. This movement is not important. Civil disobedience is not important, right? What's important is for the audience to discuss and be aware of this utter betrayal of our fundamental rights. The most fundamental right in this country is the right to livelihood and a life. And what we have down here is overwhelming scientific evidence that the people of this country are going to be liable to starve to death in the next half century. Well, th- That's this a is, substantive probability. But this is not just an argument about tactics, if you'll forgive me, which I know f- you think is trivial compared with the scale of what we face. It is an argument whether... If I gave you the whole half hour to simply repeat how many people are going to die and how awful it's going to be, and in one pamphlet you wrote at one stage you talked about mass rape, is that going to work? Because you're someone who is interested in what ultimately will work, and there are plenty of people in the old Extinction Rebellion movement, outside the movement, go, it doesn't work, it alienates people, it turns them off. People want hope. Well, as I expected, you haven't listened to me. Well, I, I think <laughs> right? you have, I've actually, tried to, to make to clear several yeah. times that I'm not, primarily, I'm not primarily motivated by what works. Right? What I'm primarily motivated by is, in a fairly inadequate way, obviously because I'm human, is to live a good life so that when I'm on my deathbed, I feel like I had some integrity at a time when society was heading for the most catastrophic collapse in the human story. Forgive me, that sounds, which I'm surprised by genuinely, that sounds like you've almost given up. It's how do I live with myself before my maker? And your mother was a Methodist preacher, and it's clear that religion played quite an important part in shaping the person that you are in your youth. It, it, it sounds as it if doesn't you've, you've given up. Given up. Or, it doesn't mean I've given up. It doesn't mean I haven't given up, right? It's just not thinking that question's important, Yeah. right? Are the, you still motivated? Co- but, I mean, that's a deep question you've yeah. asked about whether you can live with yourself and your sense of whether you've lived a good life. Were you shaped? Are you shaped a lot by the, the values, the experiences that you had at home? I think what I'm primarily shaped by is my understanding of what people do when they are presented with a catastrophic future, a catastrophic present even. And what we know and what we feel in our veins, obviously when this happens to us, assuming we're open to it, is the questions of whether we are actually going to make it or not are not the most important questions. The questions that I hope many of your audience are asking is, I've pre- been presented with overwhelming evidence of a catastrophic future for my children. What's my responsibility to my children? It's not like, what's my responsibility okay, to my children? OK, what is that responsibility? No, OK, understood, because you've said that. Yeah. W- what is it you, you think is their responsibility? Because, of course, the danger with any discussion about politics is individuals think, well, there's a great limit to what I can do, what difference I make. It's not up to me. There are forces beyond my control. So if there's someone listening or watching now and says, OK, I've heard that, he's right, what is it they can do? Well, first of all, this is not politics, right? This is one of the biggest problems with how we frame all of this and one of the reasons why people are so confused. They think that climate change, you notice I haven't used those words, right? They think that climate change is, as you said at the beginning, is an issue. It's a thing. It's on the agenda. There's policies. You know, it's got to be fitted in with our obsession for economic growth and all the rest of it, right? That's not what's going on here, right? 
What's going on here is the imposition of evil into our lives. Evil is something beyond politics. What evil is, is a scheme of creating mass death. Yeah, but you're still not answering the question, which is the person who's listening and has I'm, heard I'm, what you've said, I'm, has woken up emotionally the way you think I have not, and they say, I'm going to do something. This, what does this, Roger Hallam this is, want me to do? This is the framing of how I hope and wish that people listening to this will adopt, right? Because as soon as we feel like it's politics... Then we go into this utilitarian, does this work? What should I do? I've got to go on holiday that month, you know. How can I negotiate all my other elements of my life? But the floor right. is yours, I'm just asking. I know, I know, I'm getting to it, I'm getting to it. What do you want them to I'm do? I'm getting to it. Yeah. I'm saying on the basis of understanding what it actually is, right, that it is an evil situation, in total serious. Now, I'm not talking science fiction novels here. I'm mm. talking about Hitler, you know, the Holocaust. I'm talking about Cambodia. I'm talking about what happened in Congo. This is a beyond serious situation, right? If, yeah. the AMOC, if the AMOC current, as you may know, right, collapses before 2050, it's on the headline in the newspapers, the British people will starve. Yeah, I've right? very so, deliberately not had an argument with you. Yeah, yeah. About, so, hold on, about the science or, or the numbers. But I am going to say, because I think it's right to say, there are plenty of people who will say it's nothing like the Holocaust. The Holocaust, the deliberate industrial, industrialised destruction of a people and climate change, you think, is the responsibility of an elite. You slightly dodged the question when I said, was it deliberate? You sort of suggested it was a kind of verbal game, but it is not, therefore, the same as Pol Pot massacring people for who they are. It's worse. And the reason it's worse is because of the scale, right? Yeah, but motive matters. Motive matters. Are doing it. Motive matters, absolutely. Don't get me wrong, right? What happened in the Holocaust was an obscenity beyond words because there was a direct motive to kill. But as you well know, right, and as any legal person would say, is there's two elements to a crime, right? There's the scale of the crime and there's intentionality. And the intentionality is in the mid-ground, as it were. It's not like they didn't know, they don't have the information. They do know, and they do have the information, and they're prepared for people to die. But admittedly... But, but let's go back to what just people a minute, let's do. Let's just deal with this issue, right? <laughs> yeah. But admittedly, no-one's pretending that the elites want to kill the, war, the poor of this world just mm. because they're poor. OK. But, let yeah. me just finish. All right. But, I just told you, there's a billion people. According to peer-reviewed papers, and I could come in with a whole bunch of other ones, and yeah. people on this list... Well, you've said quite a few different it, numbers in right? this interview, but anyway, well, let's, let's, go, let's go for let's the Let's go for or... one billion yeah. people, right? Yeah. That's like 20 times the number sure. of people who were killed in World but, War II. Uh, forgive That's me, I, why it's worse. I know my audience reasonably well. I think they're at the... Listening to this, watching, they're interested in what you're saying. They're saying, what does Roger Hallam okay, want I'm me to, to do? And but, then what does the but, government do? We're yeah, still going well, to come to that. Yes. So what do people do, first of all? Now, do you want them... Uh, and do you think this would make the difference to join the ranks of people, um, say, in Just Stop Oil, for example, direct protests, whether it's kind of throwing things at paintings, whether it's lying down in the streets? Is that what's going to bring about the change? There's, there's a fundamental decision and then there's a degree of practicality with any fundamental decision, right? In the real world, there's a degree of practicality. The fundamental decision is to emotionally connect with the mm. criminality of what is happening yeah. on the basis of what is said. Yeah. Therefore, you have no choice. You have no choice morally not to enter into resistance against the British government at this time because of the intensity and extent of the horror that's coming down the line. And to be clear what you mean by resistance, because yes, well, you, you on basically that. So there's a talked about going to prison. A if you're not in prison, you're not resisting, is what you said at one stage. There's a practical side of what resistance means, right? Yeah. Resistance is a foreign notion to most people listening to this, no doubt. But it's not, like, impossible to get your head round. People resist all the time on different levels, right? What we're practically talking about here is mass civil disobedience in a UK context. Mm. And there's a pathway, which is just stop oil and dare I say, people can go onto the website and it takes two minutes and you get into the system and they will tell you what you can and can't do and all the rest of it, right? The fundamental point is, is that in order to create the change that we need in the time that we've got, 
we have no choice other than to engage in mass civil disobedience. And you believe that will make a difference? How? It's not a matter of whether it makes a difference or not. Obviously, by definition, civil disobedience makes a difference. The question is, is it at a scale which will tip a Western democratic government into enacting climate policies in the first instance. But okay. then there is a practical question, which I think is entirely fair to ask you, which is you got thousands onto the street in 2019. Since then, we're talking of small scale resistance. And unless you get many more than the 10,000 you had before, it's not going to happen, is it, what you want to happen? Governments are not going to quake. They are not going to dramatically change their policies. So are you anywhere close to that? We may be, we may be not. And the, the reason I'm saying that is not because I'm trying to avoid a question, right? It's very difficult to predict. Because Did you know before 2019? In other words, was there a moment you thought, my God, this is going to happen? I mean, we, we are now not getting just a few. Yeah, I said, I said to Extinction Rebellion, if, if tens of thousands of people go to London, there will be a result, right? That was my prediction on the basis of the study that I'd, that I'd had. But one of the things about being in this work, as it were, is, is that very difficult to predict whether those people tip over to saying I'm going to have to act because I cannot not act right and they may and they may not and if they do then we've got a chance of saving what's left to save and if we don't then we're heading into this mass starvation scenario. It often takes something very immediate very personal to tip people into action now in your case it was as a farmer seeing what the climate was doing to your farm. I think actually it's not that much about what's actually happened to you for most people. I think for most people, most people who enter this, this situation and say, I cannot live without acting, it's due to an involuntary feeling of horror. But humour me by answering one question, just, just for yeah. the sheer hell of it, we could do that. Um, your farm failed and it was one of the things that made you think there's something I need to now do something about. Yes, there's hundreds of millions of farmers around the world who've had the same experience as me, which is the trauma, and it is a trauma, of finding out that the weather systems are not going to enable them to grow the crops they wanted to grow, like... It's a financial disaster for them, but it's also an emotional disaster because they lose control of their lives. You know, you've got a nice, calm sort of life, dare I say. You know, you don't have to worry whether this studio exists every time you come no, to work. That is true. If you're a farmer, you can be the best farmer in the world, but if it rains every day for seven weeks, 100% of your crops are going to die. You know, if it's minus 20 in the winter, you're going to lose all your winter crops. The fact that it's a one in a thousand year event is no solace to you. You're losing your livelihood. But did that feel to you when that happened to you on your farm, like, like a moment? It was a moment of making real what is going to happen. So something you knew intellectually, but seeing... Exactly. This is the problem, right? And this is why civil resistance works, because we can have as nice a chat as, as we like, and, you know, I can do lots of interviews. Nothing's going to change. What's going to change is the emotion of finding people getting dragged off the street, put into prison on a mass scale, students crying on motorways, right? This is how change works. It doesn't change with all due respect, right? I've got plenty of time, right, for an intellectual discussion, dare I say. You know, I was a researcher at King's College. But at this moment, it's an obscenity to just come on a show and say, well, let's, you know, let's discuss this as if it's over there. It's not. It's in, it's in your stomach, Nick, right? Yeah. And you in know. your case, it's in your stomach enough for you to go to prison, what, twice, three times? People go, people go to prison all around the world through civil resistance. There's nothing particularly peculiar about that. Oh, right? no, but there may be people, Roger, who, unlike you, who say, for me, that is a hell of a thing to risk doing, either because they're personally frightened of it or they're worried what it'll mean for their family or how they're seen in society, their job, their ability to earn a living. So it is a big thing. The, the big thing is what's going to happen to us. That's, that's, You've no words that's, for comfort for them on, don't the, worry about going to prison. It's just, this no, is so important, you've just have, got to do it. I have no words of comfort, right? 
Let me say that again. I have no words of comfort for your audience. What I'm saying to you and your audience is get real, right? This is not the time to look for comfort. It's the time to actually understand how totally terrible this situation is and to act accordingly. But that's your duty, right, as a parent, as a citizen and as a human being. Some people will be inspired by what you say. Other people will be terrified, thinking if he is so clear about this in his mind, he'll stop at nothing. It's what, not just inconvenience. It's not just civil what I'm, disobedience. What, I'm clear what about, would it be? What, what I'm clear about is what's clear, OK? Objectively clear, which is there's a thing out there mm. called physics. Yeah, no, but right? I'm asking you whether there's any limits to this. The limits to what you do? Yeah. We have to engage in civil disobedience, civil resistance, to the point that we fundamentally change the regime, right? The regime of, of digging fossil fuels out of the out of the ground i don't know quite what that looks like and i don't need to right you don't need to have all the information to act what you have to have is the visceral horror of what's happening and what we need to do is in november is go down to london and engage in civil disobedience because that's our best bet no one's pretending it's going to be successful no one's pretending that just stop oil is necessary the best thing ever right but that's what that's the opportunity your viewers have. And it's the opportunity, dare I say, for you and also all these people, right? Well, the ones behind right? the glass who the, are yes. pressing every, the every, buttons it's and the opportunity. my producers. No, don't smile about this. It's very serious, right? This is the opportunity for you at the BBC to fulfil your duty to the British people, well, which is to say to the British government, you will no longer cooperate... With a genocidal regime. Yeah, no, it's not the duty of the BBC to do anything it of the sort, is. unfortunately. Well, it, it may be in your mind. Because what we're talking about... It's my duty to challenge what we're talking Tell us what's about, happening in November, because we don't know what's happening no, no, in November. No, 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 I'm not letting you go on that. What we're talking about here is treason against the British people. You're applying right? for a job. Now, what is happening in November? You've told people you want to come to London in November, but I don't know, they don't know, what it is you're talking about. What I want to say to your audience is, is your reaction over the last two minutes is symptomatic of why they're being betrayed, right? You're belittling of your responsibility and these people to actually make a concrete step to save our country. And you will suffer the consequences of it in the next decade. I'm suffering in this interview at the no. moment. Now, what is it what is happening say in to November your that you think you will be ta- You will be taken okay. to court. You will be taken will to be? court. You will be as oh, a member person, of the British right. establishment. Okay. All right. Right? You need to take this seriously. I'm going to be taken to court for what? You absolutely will be taken to court as a member of the British establishment for betraying the British people during the 2020s. Yeah. Right? You need to think about What would I be guilty of? You will be guilty of treason. This is a a pregnant moment of potentiality, Mm. right, for Mm. people in the establishment to decide what they want to do. In the meantime, you invited people to go to London in November. Can you tell us more? What is it you're hoping will happen then? There's a website, Just Stop Oil. There's various sort of websites. It's easy. If you're in the audience, you go on the website, you sign up, and there's a whole bunch of practical details, right? Yeah. The the fundamental point is, is making that decision to enter into that process. You don't need to make that decision ultimately by getting involved in the process. The thousands and thousands of people in this country have engaged in civil disobedience. They enter the process with a lot of fear, trepidation, but they're driven to do it and they go through a series of steps, right? And they're supported in those steps by other people that have had a similar experience of fear and trepidation. Understood. Right? That's the process. Now, over the course of this conversation, uh, you've told me how frightening it is what's going to happen. You've accused me of not doing enough and not being stirred emotionally to do enough about it. You've got to address, I think, don't you, the people who just say, I don't want to be hectored and harangued and and terrified. I want to be persuaded by cogent argument about what will change and how it will change and what will make a, a difference. To those who think that, are you just thinking they're missing the point? Yes. But they're your audience. No. The audience is the 1% of the population. Civil resistance and social change happens when 1% of the population decides that they have been morally violated to the point that they engage in resistance. Now we're getting to the point. So in a sense, all those people, and you know them well, who say, why the hell is he disrupting our lives? Or 
why are they disrupting our lives by occupying a road or why are they ruining some beautiful piece of art by throwing soup or dye at it? Your point is, it doesn't really matter what 999 people out of 1,000 think. What, what we, matters? We need the one to no. come out and fight. No, 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 no. What matters in this life is whether you violate your core values, which are objective. It's whether you violate your children, you violate your community, and you violate your country. Those are like transcultural norms, like going back 10,000 years. And what I'm saying is, is when a culture, like the culture you're part of, right, violate those norms, it's not a matter of whether you like it, whether you want to be persuaded, right? That's like, it's a stupid, it's a stupid response because you have to grow up and realise sometimes in life you have to make an act, you have to make a decision, right? Just as when you decide to defend your children's lives or you defend your country. You don't sit there and analyse it, right? Obviously, Obviously, there's a place when you're engaged in that process of confrontation resistance for looking at tactics and all the rest of it. But that's not, that's not what we need to discuss on this programme. Mm. What we need but to discuss on this programme... But you do spend time discussing it, and it does obviously sure. matter if whether it's give, working if you or give not. Me ten, yeah. If you give me ten programmes, I'm more than happy to spend well, half an got, hour... I had quite a lot of time already. Now, does it matter, therefore, that six in ten, even people who protested, said... Disruptive protesting hinders rather than helps the cause. Does that matter? No. For the reasons I've just said. So, in a way, to hell with them. So long as you stirred one person it, out of a hundred on this programme. No, you're you've totally succeeded. misrepresenting what I'm saying. It's not a strategy. It's not like, oh, those people don't matter because we're just going for those that one percent, right? We're not going for anything. We're making a statement, right? We're making a statement to eternity about the sort of people we are. That's a completely different universe, right, of mental activity. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? I do. I'm, I'm trying to say there's something totally unacceptable about the situation we're in. No, I do understand it. I just want to end on this, if we may, because I hear you all. I think it's anger, isn't it? Is it fair to describe it as anger? It's not I'm, frustration. I'm utterly, utterly infuriated. Yes. And I, look, and I'm aware... But occasionally, because we're having a civilised conversation, I've smiled and you find it annoying. Of course I find you annoying. Yeah, that's I, find, I find everything about the British establishment disgusting. Yeah. Right? Okay, well, we'll and I'm about saying that, that as, as an ordinary Understood. farmer in this country. I spent 20 years doing my part of the bargain, which is producing food, running a business, doing my bit But for I'm entitled, therefore, Roger, you... to go back to what I asked you before. You couldn't even persuade your own daughter of this. She thought you'd got it wrong. She thought your tactics were counterproductive. Productive. She walked out of Extinction Rebellion. If you can't persuade That's her... That's a cheap shot, as you know. Well, right? it's, it's, it's a hard, it's a hard it talk point, right? As you said, you said to me, you weren't going to use that sort of routine on me, right? But I'm told, hold on, you've just for accused me of being complicit record, with genocide. For the record, she's fully supportive, as it happens, right? Yeah, well, she was well, that's not. That's not the point, is it? The point is, Nick, is what are you going to do? to have integrity in your life, right? Yeah, well, what are these people going to do I to have integrity I will reflect on how I have life? integrity in my life, if you forgive me, not with a complete stranger I've only just met. I'm, I'm paid you've to ask you questions. You've had 30 years, right? Yeah. You and your generation have had 30 years to look at this information. And what you've chosen to do is have a quiet life, right? And hell's coming down the road because you didn't act in time, right? It's not my job... As a farmer, to do this, it's the political establishment's job. You've got lots of privilege, you earn lots of money. I don't have a problem with that, right? It's a nice guy in there. What are you all doing? Yeah. What are you all doing? You're not, you're not merely a farmer, Roger Adam, are you? You're a political organiser, you're a strategist. I became yeah. that Indeed. because Indeed. you didn't do your job. Yeah. Well, right? I, I would I, love I, to be I, weeding I, carrots. Yeah. Right, the reason I'm in this studio. Well, I'd, be, I'd love not... to be. I'd love to be asking questions that get answered, but we don't always get to do what no, we love. And that's the so, problem, isn't it? Yeah. That's the problem. Aren't you a depressive? Isn't this the problem? 
No. Let me let me let me finish on this, right? No, Historically, I, mean, I don't mean it. I'm not intruding into your no, 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 no. Personal. Me, what I mean let, is let that me, let me tell you what the other side of the world is, the world that you cannot see, right? Because that's one of the reasons you don't want to go to the other this other world, right? There's another world out there which is a world of acting upon your fundamental beliefs. Mm. When you act upon your fundamental beliefs, you experience a certain ecstasy, right? There's a certain glory in it. Right, which is invisible to a political elite, because that's why you're so terrified. That's why you. That's why you won't act, because you don't understand, as I see it, that there's a different way to live one's life. Right, and I, you, can, you, you can you can project. But you, you project. experience. No, let's not talk about me. We've done enough. No, about no, no. Me. But, but do you feel? Now, honestly, you've had a lot of time to accuse me of all sorts of things. Are you saying that you and you hope your supporters feel a, there's, a kind there's not of a ecstasy? Of, there's not a matter of. It's not a matter of of what I want them to do. I'm, I'm being no, descriptive. No, I'm just asking you right? to describe. Yes. So let me say quite clearly, like many, not all, and not all, ti- all times, when people are put into a cell in a police station, they have a sense of peace, a profound sense of peace. This is an involuntary e- uh, experience, right? You know, because they're going into the... They're going into the police station, they're terrified, right? It's the first time. And then they put in the cell. You'd expect them to be terrified, and often they are. But, and at the same time, they have a a sense of peace, right? This is a spiritual phenomenon, which is when people stand up against evil, there's a release. There's not a tension anymore. There's not that, that violation of your core self. And when you go into resistance, you suddenly feel like you've rediscovered your integrity. You've rediscovered the essence of what you what you think you are. You return to yourself. Right. This is a universal phenomenon when people stand against evil historically. And that's what I'm saying to your audience is this is not like uh, an accounting cost benefit analysis. Right. It's an invitation to be who you already are. Right. It's a it's an invitation to come back to what you already are, which is a fundamentally decent person. This is the, the, the zen of protest, the zen of standing up to what you insist is evil. It's, it's something that people experience. You can give it fancy religious words if you like. I don't mind, right? You know, it's, maybe it's Christian, maybe it's zen. The fundamental point I'm trying to say, right, is that, is that you can feel joy, you can feel wholeness, and you can feel connection when you enter into this resistance orientation and it's not despite entering into it. It's because you do, because you return to some sense of wholeness. You, you talked about that belief, even hope, I think, that you had in 2019, that there was a moment of change that looked possible, briefly, a moment that was dashed, rejected, in your view. Do you see another in your lifetime? Do you still have hope? I have 20 more years of my life and each day I get up and I endeavour to be the good person that I want to be. And what that means in the present context is to be in civil resistance against the genocidal British government. That's it, right? Roger Hallam, thank you for joining me on Political Thinking. Well, that certainly challenged my political thinking I wasn't sure whether he was interviewing me or I was interviewing him at times. I usually approach these interviews with some sort of rough plan, some rough structure. I even try and help the guests by giving them a sense of what we will talk about and what we won't, to try to relax them. I did that with Roger Hallam, and he threw that out of the window, and I threw my notes and my structure out of the window too. But I hope it was still a revealing conversation about what motivates him and what he believes might work to bring about political change. He's not interested in coaxing, he's not interested in wooing, he's not interested in any of the conventional tactics of political discourse. He believes that shock and anger and emotion and ultimately civil disobedience leading, yes, to a willingness to go to prison is all that will change what he refers to as the regime. And he doesn't just mean this or any other government. He means what he sees as the elite are finally forced to change. And, yeah, I've been told, apparently, I'm part of that elite. 
that I might go to court for treason. Memorable interview, wasn't it? Thanks for listening. The producer is Dan Kramer, the editor is Jonathan Brunett, and the studio manager this week, Andy Mills.